Okay, well, welcome to our uh, webinar today, which is the kickoff for the second year of the NUSF um, special funding that's um, allotted for uh, special construction, fiber to your library. And um, we're excited to be here with you. It's a nice number we have uh, at the webinar that's offered the, uh, this afternoon. And what I like is that there are libraries from all four regional areas too. So we are we've got a, a nice um, nice gathering of folks, and then we do have regional directors who have also elected to attend, and we really appreciate that because we see you as a obviously as a partner to help with uh, answering questions related to fiber uh, the fiber to the library project. Um, let's see, what was I going to say some more? Oh, I, I guess we should do our introductions. I'm Holly Wolt, and I'm with the Nebraska Library Commission, and I'm actually a member of the computer team, but primarily have been working in my tenure here with public libraries, and uh, initially with the BTOP grant uh, as a uh, manager for technical um, installation of equipment and then moved on into some other areas as basically as a advocate for broadband and now specifically I'm focused on fiber um, but anything I can do to help you increase your speed at the library is something that I'm interested in helping with um, and that's uh, my job and move on to Krista and then uh, introduce Tom Hi, um, I'm, you guys, most of you know me. I'm Krista Porter. I am the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, part of, one of my duties here is also I'm the State E-Rate Coordinator for uh, Public Libraries, which means I help all of our public libraries to apply for and receive their E-Rate funding. I've been doing that since 2009, so um, longer, long time. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be, I. Uh, will help with this as far as when it gets to the E-rate portion of doing things uh, to make sure that you can submit all your forms and get everything done correctly there. And then Tom, our special partner in uh, interagency partner or agency partner in the state. Very good. Glad you didn't mention crimes, but partner in crime. Um, <laughs> I'm Tom Rufus, Education IT Manager with the State Office of the CIO or Chief Information Officer. Um, I work with uh, a project called Network Nebraska that serves all of our schools, public schools, ESUs, public colleges, and a good share of the private schools and private colleges. And uh, we have three public libraries on the network right now, Omaha, Lincoln, and Grand Island. And on July 1, we'll be adding Beatrice. And we'll get more into that as the webinar goes along. Um, like Chris, I'm very involved in E-Rate uh, for a statewide consortium of 293 entities uh, that work together for uh, more reliable uh, and cheaper internet and, and better telecommunication services. So thanks for allowing me to be a part. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, you you're a great partner to work with in, in these projects, this project for the library. I am going to just ask everybody and to just introduce yourself. I really feel like uh, this last year, the group that went through and um, are working toward getting fiber to their library, they all kind of got to know each other and, and uh, a little bit. And I think it's important at least to begin with to um, maybe in, uh, find out a little bit about what brought you here to uh, this a webinar, of course, it's fiber, but one of I'm trying to ask a question, but try to be positive about it. And mm -hmm. it, my question would be, what would partners online experience uh, when you move to fiber uh, and a faster speed? Um, but they, you know, just what what would they be able to do that they can't do now? Maybe it's that they don't even come to the library. You can be honest about it, but just I just really want to know. You know, kind of what what the pain point is you're you're in potentially with a, a speed of uh, the internet at your library and what mm -hmm. fiber uh, will make what how fiber would make a difference. So we can just start down the list if we want to. Um, mm -hmm. I know we have some um, system directors. Maybe they can kind of paraphrase what they hear. 
Um, yeah, we'll start with the, the libraries. Um, and just because this is how they're arranged in my list, it's going to be just alphabetical by your first name. Um, so I'm going to unmute you from um, my side. And if you have a microphone, you can unmute. So Amber, I've unmuted you. If you have a microphone, you can unmute yourself and talk about what's going on in Kimball. If you, there you go. Um, I first heard about this, I don't know, like a year ago. And um, I mean, Obviously, I'm interested because it's a it would be a huge asset for the library just to have that faster speed. Um, you know, I know since we started the E-rate process um, and I got the filtering software in place, I've had a lot of frustration from patrons because it has slowed things down. So one of my hopes mm -hmm. is that with having a faster connection, even though it's being filtered, it might help balance that out a little bit. That's a good point. Thank you. All right, Beth, uh, you're next. Beth and Carney, if you have them, you can unmute yourself. Or if you don't, you can just type in the questions. We could catch up later, or is she yeah, getting? Yeah, I can't see you. No. All right, Chuck, you're up next. If you have a microphone, you can mute yourself. If you don't have a microphone, go ahead and type right away into the question so I know. And I'll just, I won't, uh, but I've unmuted you, Chuck. All right, Jessica. Looks like you are unmuted. Jessica, you should be able to talk. Okay. Um, my name is Jessica. I'm from the Battle Creek Public Library. Um, I My interest in this is just, this is not my language. Um, I don't talk computer stuff very well or anything, broadband, fiber, any of that. So uh, looking into that and just trying to figure out if it works for our library here, um, as far, you know, anytime we can offer better um, and faster services to our community is always going to be a positive. So. Mm -hmm. All right, Julie. Ah, Julie just typed in. Good timing. Uh, Julie at um, Bellevue says we are looking at renovating our library building and are interested to see to see if this would coordinate with that big project. Yeah, it definitely could if we timed right it right. Now. Right. Uh, Linda, I've unmuted you. It looks like you're unmuted. Go ahead. Right, Linda, you should be able to talk. You're unmuted. I can see. I'm on. I, am I on now? There you are. Sure yep. are. Yep. yep. Okay. I didn't know. It just all at once turned green. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of users, and we're in a community building where there's a lot of events that takes place, and, and that sometimes adds to the users using our uh, wireless so mm -hmm. we definitely need some faster connections mm -hmm. all right absolutely and Norma you're next um, you're um, I've unmuted you but you're still muted if you have a mic you can unmute there you go thank you this is Norma from Lodge <laughs> we would like to do anything positive, but more users for the line. And it's always positive to have more services, sister service. So we hope this will work with your help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Yeah. You're welcome. And Tanya, I've got you unmuted. You can. I am the new director at the Ashland Public Library. And so that is why I'm here. Um, it was brought up at our um, library board meeting about E-rate and why we aren't doing it. And then I saw the fiber issue and I was like, hey, two for one. <laughs> um, and really, you know, we have so many users, um, be it if they're using our computer lab computers, our Wi-Fi. I mean, we have a lot of kids who come even hang out outside the library to use our Wi-Fi. Um, so I think and then we have staff computers, so we're, we're using a lot. Um, and I think the faster speed is going to be a huge 
huge help in our community. Mm -hmm. Sounds very familiar, yeah. yeah. All right, if anybody else wants to uh, chime in, you can. Um, right now, I've got everybody unmuted from my side, so you're welcome to mute and unmute yourself um, if you want to. Um, anyone who, you know, please do remute yourself when you're done talking so that we can make sure there's no background noise or anything going on. Um, anyone who didn't say anything before, you want to jump in now, you can, or you can type in the questions section. Or if any of our system directors, as Holly mentioned, Denise, uh, Tammy, or Cindy, would you like to? Uh... What is the pain you hear from the libraries related to their speed? You, internet? Yeah. I'm at a different computer, so can you hear me? Yes, we do, Cindy. Yes. Oh, well, yay. Um, I'm just eager to learn more about it, to support. I'm thrilled Amber and Norma are in the conversation to support them trying to get fiber and really to help those that don't realize what fiber can do for them. And so the more knowledge I have, the better I can promote it. I think that that to me is one of the biggest things we've, we've found is that when you don't know what you're missing, you, you don't know uh, how important it is to have it. And, and it's difficult in some rural areas to really experience that uh, fast internet um, and we ha we do have many stories over the years about that but all we can say is I, I, I do think that is a, a big hindrance for uh, some libraries is they just don't even realize what they could be able to do mm -hmm. have to experience it yeah yeah and I agree with Cindy that as this is Denise in Central Plains we have to have the knowledge of what is available to even offer it or to suggest it when a topic comes up. That's that's why I'm here is to, I'm like, Cindy, I got to learn because I'm not um, well versed in this part of it. Yeah. Well. I, if there's nobody else that has anything to offer, I think we'll just go ahead and move to the next slide and just talk mm -hmm. a little bit about today's agenda. So again, this is a great opportunity for everybody to learn more about um, E-Rate Special Construction and our um, established now uh, Nebraska Public Service and USF state matching funds for additional funding for fiber uh, construction to the library. Um, <coughs> This um, is the second year, like I said before, uh, so we've had our first year done and we had, uh, well, not done yet, I guess we don't have the fiber lit or anything, but basically as far as the programming, uh, as, as far as submitting forms, et cetera, that's all been uh, completed. We have seven libraries, five have been received their funding notification letter for fiber, and I don't know if Krista has an update, but there were two more that they haven't been denied. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are, you know, I think they're still waiting and pending uh, for fiber. So we're very excited about that opportunity uh, for them and um, and being the first to go through with that. Uh, let's see what I want to say. So what what this is is an overview, and I uh, you won't get all the information you need, but you should get enough information to to maybe know what questions to ask and to see if this is what you want to do. We will be offering a training, and there. There, none of this requires you to do anything or buy into anything. You are still learning about it. Our famous words from Tom at our last uh, training was, you're going fishing. So you're just checking this out and finding out more information. Uh, we think we've got quite a deal for you, but uh, you know it has to be right for you and your community in, in order to be engaged in it. And so the other topic we're going to cover, and it was alluded to a little uh, as um, from one of the library uh, directors, is SIPA. Um, I hear a lot from uh, libraries that you know that can be an issue for them as far as considering using E-rate funding, and and this project is based with E-rate funding. The E-rate funding is uh, for special construction, and your application for that put you uh, in line to be able to apply for that extra 10% from the uh, Nebraska Universal Services Fund, which then 
uh, if you are funded, or you would automatically be matched with additional money, which is another 10% from the federal uh, FCC from the government. So, uh, so that is the basis for it. And if we want to be sure that we talk a little bit about SIPA, so you understand more about why you it isn't maybe not as big of an issue as you might think it is. And then we want to talk about what your options are for. Uh, for applying for fiber we we pretty much we have two options one is more library driven this would be library directors being more re responsible in fact responsible for moving the the process through and the other one is um called network nebraska which is what uh, tom is uh, engaged in and and overseas for the most part i believe maybe you are the overseer of that um, and it is another option that is becoming um, um a uh, of more interest to our our libraries too and each of them has slightly different ways of approaching things so if you work with network nebraska they are able to take care of more of the you know the bidding process because it goes through the state for evaluation etc and and you are not doing it locally um, and so we also want to just overview for you what it is you need to do um, to uh, properly apply for e-rate how do you solicit for a fiber bid and we're also going to be engaged with i don't know how many of you have been listening to the news lately and i know i've received a couple of emails from uh, system directors about um, items related to broadband in the legislature but i believe there were like 19 bills that were proposed originally or, or put forth by senators related to broadband and um, there are two that have been signed by the governor and they actually impact this project so we'll be talking about that and providing you information about that as well as all this federal funding that's coming in and some of that can be used for um, uh, broadband um, fiber or equipment to support fiber in your library. So I think that is about all I wanted to cover on this slide. So here we go. We're going to talk about planning for your uh, uh, fiber install. And one of the things is, again, this the NUSF portion of it is a four-year plan. This would be year two. And we are uh, excited about the opportunities that you'll have. So we'll switch on. This is just a header page. We'll go to the next. In particular, we wanted to, sh to show you this is the calendar year for the library uh, for E-Rate. Um, that some of you are familiar with. It looks like uh, maybe about three or four of you actually do apply for E-rate already. So the July to June calendar sequence should be something that you're familiar with. And we uh, will start with Tom talking a little bit about how the Network Nebraska uh, bidding process goes for starting with the funding year and the beginning for 470 all the way to your fiber being lit at the end of the funding or the beginning of the next funding year, July 1. Very good. Thanks, Holly. Um, so you can see from the calendar here, the first strip of white boxes um, suggests that it'll be managed by Network Nebraska. It's a year long uh, process uh, to involve yourselves with E-rate do the procurement, um, qualify for the special construction matching funds, then uh, place an order with the vendor, and then the fiber is actually constructed with the goal of uh, turning the service on on July 1, 2022. That sounds like a lot, sounds like a long time, uh, but trust me, it moves very rapidly and you have a great cast of support characters here at the Library Commission and or Network Nebraska to help you through that process. So um, this is an excellent start. Finding out more information about special construction, how do we maximize our state and federal funding, and is this uh, an affordable project for our public library. So we help a lot for those libraries 
that um, want to take a chance with the state. But if you look at the second row of boxes, as Holly mentioned, um, you're actually uh, in charge of the very same parallel process. And what's neat about what we're presenting today is that the two um, structures are not um, mutually exclusive. You can actually seek bids for fiber locally. You could allow the state to do that for you and then compare the two processes without obligation to either one. So you may get all the way through procurement, get bids back, and may find that the community says we're not uh, able to do that at this time. You could postpone for another year. Or yes, this is definitely in our future. We wanna do it as soon as possible. And should we select a local contract with a provider or enable the state to do that on our behalf. So that's kind of a, a profile of the, the same process, but in its two flavors. Holly, if you have anything oh. else to add on this one. Well, I think that the, the thing to remember too is you can go through this whole process. There's no obligation. And these are the kinds of things that I think are important for you to know too, that there's no obligation. You can um, submit a, a Form 470 and, and yourself and you can ask Tom to do that on your behalf through the state and you can get all this material back and, and you can say, no, I, I don't think we, we're going to do it this year. And one thing that's good about that is at least it gives you an idea where you what where you're at as far as your costs are concerned with that. The other thing I don't think we mentioned at our last uh, webinar, uh, but I think it's important for you to know, you do not need to be an accredited library to participate in this program. So um, I just want to to be sure that you're aware of that. I think that we're ready to move forward from here. So I think what I was just trying to make a point about here is, and what I found out from last year with the libraries, there's a lot of acronyms, there's a lot of parts and pieces to this, and you might feel overwhelmed by it, but that's what that calendar is kind of, I hope helps you to understand. It's a long, year-long process. Uh, again, as Tom said, we're here to help you, but some of the items that you may not be familiar with is, you know, with E-rate, um, you may not know how do I access E-rate and as far as with the uh, NUSF funding grant it's actually very simple it's a two-page process grant that you uh, fill out on a Word document and most of that you already know and can copy from the results of your bidding process and just put it in there and send it via email you can put an attachment on and send it off to uh, the Nebraska Public Service Commission where they will review it and they do have questions sometimes. But again, it's, n it's not a cumbersome process and it's part of that calendar year uh, at a time when, uh, when you will be doing that. Um, and then the, the only other thing I wanna mention is, and we will talk about this more in our training, that we have funding in E-rate also for your network infrastructure, because I'm sure some of you aren't even thinking about this, but I'm aware uh, that some uh, libraries are still using their routers that they received 10 years ago mm -hmm. with our grant from the Library Commission. And, um, but you may be thinking, oh, I just can't afford to get fiber and then have to uh, do uh, make a change with my equipment and pay for that. Those are things that um, that we we can handle and work with you. So the best thing to do, I think, and as we go through today, and if you have questions beyond, is to just ask those questions. And again, there are requirements in order to participate in this grant. For heaven's sakes, you know, you have a 70% funding and then another 20%, you probably have some sort of an obligation to do some things um, as those who are awarding you funds want you to do. And in this case, you know, you have um, the SIPA we've talked about and with the NUSF 117 grant, and I have an asterisk there because I think by the end of our uh, webinar, you'll see that things may have changed slightly with this, but at a minimum, they're asking you to apply for, you know, you have to apply for uh, 100 megabits per second. And I think originally they were thinking uh, 100 down, 20 up, but things will be changing related to that. 
but you'll realize that that's not enough even in a small rural library to provide patrons with um, the type of internet that they need for say some kind of makerspace equipment or to offer a uh, some type of training um, in the library uh, definitely when everybody has a cell phone and their own a device it, it really uh, becomes a problem with uh, very quickly so uh, so anyway I think we move forward and I think Krista you're our next mm -hmm. yep okay. all right um, so, so that's kind of a, a, get a nice introduction to everything we're going to be talking about today and what this is all about. Um, I'm going to get into the specifics of, a little bit of the specifics of how you're going to apply for this, um, what it's all about in E-Raid and in the system there. Um, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, uh, go ahead and type into the questions section you go to webinar interface. Um, or if you want to ask um, just on your microphone, uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, raise your hand just so we know that you want to ask something, and I'll make sure that I pause um, so that you can do that. Uh, now, as, as uh, Holly mentioned, we know that some of you do apply for E-Rate already, and some of you don't. So we're going to do, it's going to be a very general, very, very general quick overview of E-Rate and what it is and what it does. Uh, for some of you, it'll be a refresher, which is always good to have. Uh, for some of you, it'll be new. But um, this is not in-depth. Uh, I usually do do a workshop in the fall when the regular E-Rate process starts up, um, a two to, two to three hour workshop specifically about how to apply. So if you do um, want that, that will be coming up if you want to look into you know watching that. Um, we will also have special workshops specifically for special construction coming up later as well that you will we'll have the more of the details. This is more a overview uh, introduction to it. So uh, E-Rate is an FCC program uh, to get discounts on, for schools and libraries on their internet and telecommunication costs. This is the official uh, wording here uh, from their uh, uh, we're a website to ensure that schools and libraries can obtain high speed internet access and telecommunications at affordable rates and keep students and library patrons connected to broadband by providing a discount on eligible services. Um, it is uh, overseen by the FCC and they created a not for profit organization called USAC, the Universal Service Administrative Company, who does the day to day running of the program. So that is who you will deal with um, whenever you are applying for E rate. Um, as Holly mentioned, all public libraries in Nebraska are eligible to apply for E-Rate. There's no other requirements besides being a public library here in the state. <laughs> um, and uh, discounts that you can receive will range. They depend on the um, school lunch number of students that are in the school lunch program in your area. Um, they range from 20 to 90 percent. And I can get you specifics on what yours are if you are interested. Um, that's the URL for our Library Commission's general E-Rate webpage. We can go for lots more information about E-Rate. I'm going to talk a little bit about it here. But um, just so that you know, um, you can go there. There's a recording of last year's training and lots more information. Um, Tanya, you have a question. I see you got your hand up. You can go, in, go ahead. Um, the For the discount range, um, I know it goes off of the free and reduced meals. Is that the people who apply for the free and reduced meals or the people who are eligible to apply? It's actually, that's a very good question and that's a very important thing. It's who is eligible, not necessarily who applies. Okay. Awesome. So it would be potentially a higher discount, higher number. Um, and that is important to note, yes, that um, in communities, not everybody who's eligible necessarily will apply. Um, they don't think they, they don't need it or they just don't want to um, for other reasons. But it would just be um, whatever has been reported to the Nebraska Department of Education is who, how many students are eligible to apply. So there is no information, um, there's nothing, and also no information is handed over about who applied or who the names of these children are, these families. It's just a number, you know, 67% you know, of, of the students are eligible. That's the only thing that's um, um, handed over that we look at for this. So what is E-Rateable? What can you get a discount on? Um, every year there is an eligible services list that is published. The FCC puts that out um, in case it changes. Um, they do pay attention to uh, you know, changes in technology and new things they might need to cover or not cover. So there's a new list you look at every year to make sure you know what's coming. Um, and there's two categories, two, it's separated into two categories, services providing connection to the building. And then once you have that internet connection, how do you make it work throughout the building? 
on your campus. Um, and I've got a little graphic here put together. You can see that uh, brick there would be the walls of the building. So category one is gen it would be just bringing it anything outside, and then inside would be all that equipment. And this is what Holly mentioned as well. Um, your uh, connections and, and equipment, do you need to update things? Do you have a modem and a router that's been in there for so long that it's buried under dust? <laughs> um, do you need more access points or switches, racks, servers, anything that is that physically within the building, those pieces of equipment, uh, cables, everything, this isn't everything here, but anything that will make it work. Um, you'll notice here though that what is not eligible is the end device, what you use to connect to that internet service. E-rate is all about the service. Um, itself. So your actual laptops or phones or anything that's going to be using it um, are not eligible for E-rate discount, just what makes the internet service work, what brings it to the building, and then what makes it work throughout the building. So specifically in category one, um, basically anything that can get you high speed broadband, um, overpower alliance, cable modems, DSL, uh, wireless, satellite, um, anything you can think of, and fiber that's highlighted here. I've got it kind of bolded. Uh, that's specifically what we're talking about today is getting that fiber connection. Uh, that's the extra funding we're talking about today. But any way that you can get internet to your building is category one. Category two, all the pieces of equipment. Um, hopefully, and, and Holly had spoken previous in a uh, in the past about helping libraries with their network and their uh, closets. And this is a very nice looking one here, Holly. I'm not sure if you've seen any, come across any that are like this. <laughs> I have at libraries. And, and you have? Oh, awesome. Because I always see the alternative. <laughs> it can That's be a mess. You may be totally, you know, you may have something that looks not this neat and pretty, but all the wires are everywhere. You don't know what's in there. It's under a desk. It's behind something. It's in a closet. Um, but all of that could potentially need updating. Um, so um, your cables, your the actual rack, the physical piece of you know, furniture that this sits on, um, power supplies. Um, also, if you need any updates being done to these, online ongoing maintenance of this um, software that needs to be installed, all of that work as well. So it's not just the piece of equipment and then you're left hanging, but you need to keep things updated. You need to install software to make the network work. Um, and this is the kind of thing that Holly would help you um, to evaluate as well. Correct, Holly? That you yes. talked about that before. I I do an assessment with each library if they were in need of that type of an assessment. And and I would also help you to understand, um, uh, we talked about uh, uh, RFP, uh, request for proposals for equipment, et cetera. That part of it uh, related to submitting to E-rate, I would also be engaged in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't have to understand all this necessarily. That's okay if you don't right now. We can help you with that. Holly will help you with that. <laughs> Now we did mention SIPA, yes, and filtering. Um, this is a any funding that anytime you receive funding from the federal government that's related to providing internet service, you do need to be in compliance with SIPA, the Children's Internet Protection Act. Um, this is the protecting children from all the bad things on the internet. Uh, so the actual so this applies for pretty much almost everything E-rate related, getting connection to the library and um, paying buying all of that equipment. Um, E-rate can be um, overwhelming to some people. It can be confusing. Uh, luckily for our purposes, it's not too, too, too confusing if we just look at it very simply and clearly related to E-rate purposes. Um, I'm not going to talk about, well, I'm not going to give advice or opinion on if it's something you need to do in your community or not. That is a local decision. You can decide, um, you, your board, your community, if you do want to filter or not um, and at what level. Um, but for E-rate purposes, if you want to um, receive their discounts and funding, you do need to figure out some way to do it. Um, E-rate, the SIPA Act is actually not very long, which is something beneficial to us as well. 12 to 14 pages if you actually printed it off the internet. Uh, not a lot of wording to it. Um, and it really requires these um, few things here. Um, an internet safety policy, uh, which is something you may already have, actually. Uh, this is just basically a state something, a policy that states how people uh, can and can't use the internet when they're in your library. Um, don't look up anything illegal. Um, don't hack our systems. <laughs> don't do things like that. Um, so you probably possibly already have something like that in, in place in your general library use policies. Um, and the second, a technology protection measure. Uh, that's the, your their large 
freezing for a filter. Um, and this can be any type of internet filter that, that blocks things coming through on the internet. It can be individual software installed on each workstation, each, each computer. Um, it can be something at your server level. It can be something at your ISP level. They may handle your filtering for you and that's just where it goes through. Um, the key to this is that it is uh, to block anything that is coming in for um, what SIPA considers minors, which are 17 and under, that is their legal definition of it in, in the act, um, not to, to access anything that is um, visually graphic representations of anything um, illegal, um, pornographic, those kind of things. What level you have that at is up to you. Uh, some libraries, um, the range of um, opinions on SIPA goes from block anything and everything, protect the children at all costs, to the other end of the spectrum, don't even talk to me about it. It is um, an intellectual freedom issue and it is censorship and I'm not gonna block anything. We're going to let our community decide how they wanna look at and anything and everything in between. Uh, for E-rate purposes in SIPA, you just have to have a, a filter installed in some way and have it turned on at whatever level of um, blocking, blocking you need. Um, in many cases, you can have it at the very lowest level, low, and it blocks hardly anything, and nobody ever notices it's there. But you end up, you get your E-rate discounts. So <laughs> uh, There is also the third um, requirement of SIPA is having some sort of a public notice and meeting or hearing. You know, hearing may sound very in intimidating, but just basically have it a discuss it with your community. Generally, this would be done not as a special event or special meeting, but it would just be an agenda item on your library's uh, uh, board meeting, a board meeting of your library board. Uh, so as long as you've done something like that, that is something you just have to do once. The first time you've done this, you may have done that by back when you first decided to do filtering, and that's fine. You don't have to do it regularly, you know, every year or something. Um, there's a lot of more details about SIPA on the USAC website there. I've got their direct link and on our E-Rate website that I had linked earlier. Um, I've got some information and um, about looking up what kind of filters there are available and what you can do. Uh, but it is required for what we're talking about here today that you do need to be in compliance with it. Anybody have any questions about, uh, at this point, about SIPO or anything we've talked about? You can type in your question section. Yes, Tanya, go ahead. Um, you need to be able to turn the filters off, correct? Sorry? You need to be able to turn the filters off if somebody wants Yes, to. that is correct, too. That's also a very important um, um, feature that um, needs to be remembered, too. That's something that um, for anyone who is an adult who is doing something for bona fide legal work, um, you have to have a way to turn it off. That is also something that some people don't realize, that you can turn it off. It, if somebody, you're not going to be constantly, permanently blocking anything somebody wants to use. Um, the, can can you say what the legal age, what is the age of the, 17. The, yeah. 17 is what, and under, so is what SIPA determines is a minor. Mm -hmm. So, and then, okay. is, is there any, so like our filter, we have minimal filters and somebody else controls them. So we just put in a ask to remove, you know, mm -hmm. our pharmacy got blocked because of drugs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, so and then we just put it in but it can take a couple hours before they remove that block is mm -hmm. that too and that's 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 not the best there is nothing in sipa that states anything like rules about it has to be done immediately it has to be done quickly uh unfortunately there's nothing that says that um quicker would be better so or, or for you to have more control um so that you can you know if somebody comes in and says i'm researching for you know breast cancer and your you know filters have blocked the word breast i need to do this because i'm here right now you'd hope you could say oh hang on let me go in the back and flip a switch or type a few things in we'll be back in 10 minutes and you'll be good to go um but that's not always the case yeah uh sometimes you have to tell them we can get that taken care of and you'll have to come back. Unfortunately, and I wish there was, there's nothing that says it has to take a certain amount of time and be quickly done. Tanya, can I ask you who, is this like a web-based filtering or why does it take that long? Um, it runs through Access Systems, um, who, who helps run our computers. And we're switching um, to Bizco and hopefully that'll make it a little more 
uh, and smooth to be able to do some of those things. And really, we have, like I said, minimal um, filters on there. They just, I have one patron who manages every single time to hit one website. I mean, it's it, it the one that's being yes. <laughs> yeah. not, It doesn't blanket like breasts, it blankets like certain websites that will get blocked. True. Yeah, that, and that's changed a lot of times how social filtering is done. It's done based on IS or IP address or um, the actual URL or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, that is important to realize. You you can turn it off. Um, also, something important which some people do not um, remember always. This has to be the the filter has to be on every computer that the library owns that connects to the internet that is being covered, that is receiving an E-rate discount. This includes staff computers. So even though SIPA is about blocking children from accessing things, the act itself did not does not say only on children computers that children use. It says on all of the it's all of the library's computers is what it actually says. So yes, you will need to install a filter on all of your staff computers as well. However, as we just discussed, thank you, Tanya, you can then go and turn it off on all of your staff computers like so that they can do their jobs. And that's okay, and you're in compliance. That's all the things you need to know. Any other questions here? I don't want to take up too much time on this. And like I said, we get more into this in the E-rate workshops too and look up more information online. All right, so there are, um, Holly mentioned in that calendar at the beginning as well, um, E-rate is an uh, annual process, an ongoing thing throughout the year. There are multiple forms that you submit. I'm not going to go into the details of all these forms here, just so you know that there are these um, things that you'll be doing in order um, in my full E-rate training. That's when we get into all the details of all of them. Um, so it generally starts, um, the first storm does, form does become available um, in July of a year, and then the other ones follow throughout the year, um, throughout the fall and into the spring, and sometimes in the summer of the next year. Um, so these are the forms. In the past, they were paper forms. They're not anymore, yay. It is all done online, so we are so happy about that. Um, don't be intimidated by this this graphic here, this picture. Um, they are forms, but they're all online. Well, and I Chris, think, yeah, go ahead, Tom, go. Uh, we should mention um, the NUSF application process is kind of wedged between 470 and right. 471. Yes. So when they hear back from the Public Service Commission that yes, you've been approved for this funding, then the copy of that letter gets submitted with their 471 mm -hmm. to USAC in order to get the greater discount. Right, yeah, so what I've got here, this is just the E-rate process and this new thing we're doing with the Public Service Commission um, fits in there in between the, yeah, 470, 471, and I've got actually a future slide that talks about that too. I also want to mention when you're looking at these forms and being intimidated, um, Krista does work directly with you um, as you work towards submitting for the special construction. At least this last year she did it. I'm sure she would again remotely is able to assist you looking right at your form as you're getting you know prepared mm -hmm. and then submitting it, which is a really is really great because some folk we had some library directors who just did it on their own and it's interesting one of them in particular um, I can address it later if we have some time but she uh she did it wrong and but she's just that kind of a library director she's like oh well i'll resubmit it i'll delete you know i'll, I'll delete that one and resubmit it and and uh, others are just so worried that they might make a mistake you should know that you can and you can in many cases recover from it but if you visit with Krista and have her help you i think you'll have a great chance of getting that i mean you know, i don't know why you wouldn't get the form completely in and be able to have a success with your form yeah, everything can be fixed mistakes can be fixed things can be canceled and redone yeah right. um yeah what holly's mentioning yeah what i have been I, what i do do with libraries is um i will actually set up just like we're doing here a go-to webinar session with you and have you show share your screen with me so i can see exactly what you're doing on your forms and i can tell you click there no not there the one to the left and i can see everything that you're doing so we do that i handhold you through the whole process if necessary um and i will sit on the session with you for an hour, however long it takes to um, get you through your whole form. And I think if you mess up, and uh, she'll she'll even help you get out of your mess. 
right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, yes, I um, as the state e rate coordinator, I can um, work with the um, reviewers who are looking at your forms, <clears throat> and if needed, and I have done it before, bump things up to their managers. It, things need to be done sometimes. Um, oh, and we do have a question, a good question. Amber asked um, <clears throat> the questions. Is it normal that I still haven't heard if I am approved for this year? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> um, the E-rate process is, is, a, is a, can be a long process for approval. Um, the E-rate funding year, um, as it says is um, in the previous calendar, starts July 1st is when your funding would be, your discounts would start. However, they're working on reviewing all their forms right now. And sometimes it does take, um, and, and as Holly mentioned too, a couple of our fiber libraries still haven't returned yet either. Um, generally every Friday they announce the next wave of approvals. So we'll see tomorrow if any new ones have come through. And um, they can keep reviewing things on and, and don't just get, get scared. I don't want to see an even sadder face than what they up into the fall, into December, into November, sometimes people have not heard back yet. However, that doesn't, um, you don't lose out on any of your funding if they don't approve it until that late. You still get funded back to July 1st. It's just all retroactive and you get all of that all at once. So you will eventually get all that if you are approved. But um, it is common, yes. We still have, um, right now, the last time I did, I think we've got 64 libraries who've applied and 50 some have been approved. We're still waiting on um, 10 or so um, left that have not received approval as of when I just checked on Tuesday. So um, yes, yeah, sometimes you do have to wait. Um, and that's the thing with the E-rate too, sometimes it's a risk. You may have to start paying your bills in full in July, but eventually you will get credited once they do get your application and hopefully you get approved. All right, so as I said, this is all done online now through the E-Rate Productivity Center. EPIC is the um, acronym for that. Um, you do submit all of your forms on here. Um, if there are any questions that E-Rate has that they're reviewers, they will, um, um, you'll answer them here. They'll send you an email that they have a question, but you go into this. It's a one-stop shopping for everything E-Rate related. Um, so your notifications will be your forms, everything. And there's a URL to get to that. This is just a screenshot of the main landing page. As I said, I'm not going to go into all the details of submitting your forms today, but just this is where you will go to do everything. Um, and this is where some things I can see into your accounts in here as a state E-Rate coordinator. Um, sometimes I do that screen sharing with you and have you show me what's what's going on in your in your system. Now what we're um, working with today this um, oh Amber do you want to ask another question or is that still your hand up from before sorry hang on let me I've unmuted you if you wanted to ask another question or um, so if I'm waiting on my approval because in order to do the fiber optics I have to be approved for e-rate already correct um if it depends on what you've put into your um, application, we are actually having when we're doing it through this program, we are putting in a clause that says um, even if you sign a contract with the provider, nothing will be paid unless it's all under, you know, unless the E-rate um, application is approved. Okay, so then it's not so if I don't get approved until October, it's not going to hinder me starting the process in july for the fiber optics does that make sense oh, no no for the next year it would be that right. you're, you're you're going for the next funding year i i don't believe it would i'm sorry okay Chris. yeah no i mean it's it's just a matter of that the provider has to understand that um the clause that we are putting in when we do this as i said states in in legal terms if we don't get e-rate funding the project doesn't go ahead so um and that, that's what we have as the wording. So for all of these libraries doing this special fiber, um, the way it's worded is we don't do anything until the approvals come through. Now, right now, you have, you're still waiting for your current year to be done. Now, have you already, is your current E-rate application having to do with installing fiber or it's just your, right now, it's just your regular? It's my regular service. Uh, but I thought when I did this, this seminar last year, I thought that I had to be on E-rate for my service in order mm -hmm. to apply for the fiber optics. Oh, for the for when the monthly service starts, you mean? Exactly. 
Yes, yes, and that will follow after doing yes, because what you're gonna okay. what you're gonna apply for here is both getting the fiber installed and getting the monthly service starting in July. The now, special. If, uh, well, if, I think what I think I understand what she's saying. I think you don't have to be on. You can start from not being on E-rate at all in July 1 of this year, 2021, you can begin the process of applying for special construction fiber. But mm -hmm. then Krista, they also at the same time, they're, they're applying for their um, monthly recurring cost internet as part of that. That's so I'll let you Right, I right. Think and I see what you're talking. Yeah. Uh, so if if because you haven't been approved yet, like if hypothetically uh, you hadn't been approved yet by July, so this fiber hasn't been installed, that's okay because it's going to have to wait until that can be installed, and then that's when things will start because you won't have the fiber until it's installed. I, I, I think that <laughs> I, I think she's actually applied for no fiber at all. Right. And so mm -hmm. she's going to get it this next year because mm -hmm. she'll want to have that internet service until July of the of the next year when she is happily installing fiber and has a contract with that vendor for three years for a gig for her library. That I'm mm -hmm. just dreaming, but that would be <laughs> nice. So so what? Are, there are two different filings that I think is what the confusion yeah. is. And your, anyway. and your connection can change in the middle of the year, too. So if you start in July with your non-fiber connection, just because the fiber is not going to be installed for some reason until June or August, and then at that time it can switch to be then the fiber is what you're getting the discount on. That's a whole thing that's built into the process, too. So things can change in the middle of the year. That's Ideally, this would all get approved and done before July, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, but this is our this year we're in right we're in right now is the first time we've done this and as we said we've got two libraries we're still waiting to hear um, but it's only May so they still have all of June to get approved and then get the fiber installed before July starts so okay. we're hoping with this being special construction that that would be nudging the reviewers and E rate on. So the special construction that we're talking about is the, as it says here, the cost involved with actually getting that new fiber run to the, run to the library. So special construction, this is um, a, a special section of category one, um, only for if you don't have fiber yet, um, you can have the construction um, discounted, any design, project management, anything going along, goes along with getting that run to your library can apply for and get a discount on. Um, if you're lucky, <laughs> it can begin earlier before that July 1st start date of the funding year. They know that sometimes um, processes and, and schedules won't necessarily match up, be able to wait until the funding year. So this the actual work can be done before that July start of the official E-rate funding year. And so anytime after July 1st, you could potentially start digging trenches and having things installed so that you're ready to go July 1st. That's the perfect scheduling of it. Hopefully that'll work out with our last two libraries. Um, and what we have, what they have also set up, E-Rate e USAC has set up the state matching fund program. This is something they set up about five years ago, four or five years ago, where if a state entity if will put up part of the funding for the extra part that the library has to cover, E-Rate will match that. So the way a project would work is you have a project that costs, and this is just made up numbers. I don't know if any of them actually going to cost. I don't, none of ours is going to cost this much, but it like, makes for nice math. $100,000 to do a fiber project, and your library is eligible for 80% discount. E-rate covers $80,000, and the library is responsible for that extra twenty. We have a state matching fund who will contribute 10% of the project, so they say we'll cover 10,000 of that. And then E-rate says, great, since your state has done that, we'll cover, we'll match that, cover the other 10,000, and it costs zero for the library. So pretty we cool had two libraries that were in that situation will be yeah. in that situation this year. So that 80% discount. Free fiber. <laughs> yep. The perfect line. Now here in Nebraska, our E-rate discounts, our average is 73% of our libraries at the moment. So some of you will pay a little bit. Some of you might not pay anything. Um, if your E-rate discount is over 80, you don't get money back. <laughs> There's nothing like that. Um, it just covers everything. So what we have is this Nebraska Universal Service Fund and USF 117. And this is the extra thing that you'll apply for that Tom mentioned in between the um, 470 and the 471. Um, the Starting last year, they budgeted a million dollars to use over four years time 
to help um, cover that extra cost for any um, libraries or schools, which most of our schools I think are all good to go. Uh, but this will be libraries that are not currently have do not currently have fiber. So you do your form 470, um, starting off your A rate process that goes live as I said July 1st, and then um, you will also submit to the Public Service Commission the NUSF 117 application, saying that you want to um, use that special. Um, matching funding if we do get approved. You'll send them a copy of 470. Um, you'll pick who, who you've wanted as your provider and let them know. Um, like I said, you, you pick your provider, but even if you sign a contract with them or an agreement, there's that clause that says, this only will happen if we get approved by E-rate. So nothing is in stone. You're not um, committed to anything, even at this point when you're applying for and asking for all this funding, you still are, have an out. Um, so this is a good check out and see how much this might cost. Um, and I'll tell you too also the timings we have in here, the mid-December 2021, this is what the timing worked out for last year. We're assuming they'll be at the same kind of timeline for upcoming year, um, but don't, you know, quote me on that. Um, then the commission will send you a letter if they approve it, which you will then include that letter when you submit your 471, the um, second part of the process letting, letting USEC know that we um, picked a provider and we do have this matching funding. Um, also, with your 470 is what you would you would include the RFP that Holly would help you work on, um, which we'll work, talk more about. Um, and so that's the basics of how the process will work going through E-rate. And like I said, we will help you and hold you through every step and make sure you get all these forms um, and all these things submitted um, with, between myself and Holly and Tom. Any other questions before we move along? All right. I guess it's back to you guys. Yeah, I think this is Tom. Tom's uh, portion. This is talking about uh, what your options are for fiber. So we'll let you start, Tom. Very good. Thank you. So as we've talked about already in the presentation, we have two parallel processes, uh, either Network Nebraska or driven by the local library. And a lot of those steps are the same. It's just who gets to do them. But one subtlety uh, a subtle difference between being involved in the statewide network, Network Nebraska, or getting internet service at your local area directly from a provider is that they're technically two different services. When we say ISP or internet service provider internet, it's delivering you data plus transport. So we think of that as the pipe plus the water in the pipe is actually the internet. When we're dealing with Network Nebraska, since the start of the project, we deliberately separated transport, which is a fiber, from the internet or the water that runs in the pipes, and we tend to bid or procure those two services separately. We've had great success with that. Um, we've driven down the cost of fiber to rural areas, uh, unit costs by about 75% on average. And we've driven down the cost of internet since we started the project by 99%. And then our job, according to the legislature, is to pass those savings on to the entities that comprise Network Nebraska. So that's our, our directive, our primary mission, um, speaking you know, with a bias, We'd love to have more libraries participate, but both um, service levels um, can meet the needs of the public library. So next slide. So on the left-hand column, mm -hmm. this would be the local ISP working directly with the local library. On the right side, as Holly mentioned, the state can be um, perform some of these functions for you. And you'll see here that a lot of the bullets are the same. We need a Form 470 in the FCC language to start the procurement. If you're doing it locally, um, Holly and or Krista will help you with that initial form, which will be coupled with an RFP, and you do what we call putting it out on the street, and you're trying to attract interest from vendors to bid on your project. In many of the rural areas in Nebraska, that's only one provider. Some areas, two or more. 
And competition between vendors is the number one determiner of cost. So they charge you what they need to in order to get your business. On the right side, very similar. We would do the Form 470 for the libraries that elect to participate. You would be part of a much larger RFP driven by the state. And then we, in both processes, ask for detailed costs for construction of the network, design and engineering, and project management. And vendors have to uh, partition their costs when they reply in these different categories. Otherwise, there would be no special construction expenses. And therefore, it wouldn't do any good to apply for grant funds because the costs that they've enumerated would be ineligible. So they have to be in these three categories. At the end of the 28 day or longer bid period, at the local level, as Holly will explain, the public library would convene a small committee to review those bids and select a potential winner. And at the state level, we do the exact same thing with the mathematical formula. Um, state uh, purchasing has worked with our agency over the last um, 15 years, we're veterans of over 20 different RFPs, and every vendor must comply with the state's terms and conditions for legal and technical. Next slide. So here again on the left side, getting an approximation, every library director and every library board is interested, what's it gonna cost me? and maybe some of you are answerable to uh, a city council or a village board as well. So in the left-hand side, as best we can estimate, your non-recurring fiber build cost, you'll get the, your normal E-rate discount plus uh, 20% or up to 20%, as long as you're not a 90% library, and then you'd get a plus 10%. And that would be true in both of these occasions. We use your E-rate discount that you inherit from your school district. Um, your cost for service after the fiber has been constructed is called your monthly recurring cost. As Holly mentioned, you have to take out service at at least 100 megabits or greater to uh, qualify for this program. And uh, you may ask for only 100 by 100 at the local level, or you may ask for multiple increments so that you have growth potential over the life of the contract. We do the exact same with the state. Um, we might bid for you five different increments, up to 500 meg, or maybe it might be 1,000 meg, and then we'll get bid costs back on each of those increments. On the left-hand side, your internet service provider can also charge you a miscellaneous taxes and fees or surcharges as part of that service. And they are also E-rate eligible as long as they're known in advance. And you can apply for those with your Form 471. Major difference between these two alternatives, Network Nebraska is a state consortium convened by the legislature and as part of our statute, they said, even though we're voluntary, we must also be self-funded. So we have costs of maintaining the network, the statewide backbone, and some administration for hardware, software, and personnel support. And we boil those down into monthly fees that are paid for by all the consortium members. For public libraries, we try to keep those absolutely as low as possible because we know the budgets are tight, and yet you still are deserving of the fastest telecommunication services that are available. So what we would do as part of the procurement and then the bid and the award process is break out those costs for you so you know the total project cost upfront and ongoing um, to enable you to make the best decision possible. In some cases, the higher the bandwidth, the better match you would be for Network Nebraska, and you may elect to go that way. In other cases, small library, more modest speeds, 
it may be that you deal with an internet service provider directly. And that's the beauty of this, is that you get to evaluate both alternatives, neither of which is an obligation until you know the total cost, communicate with your decision makers and make sure it's the way uh, that you wanna go and it's most fitting for the community. Next slide. So the pros and cons of either option. Um, I probably shouldn't be the one <laughs> sharing this information because as administrator for Network Nebraska, I'm biased with the service level that we create for all of our participants. But both of these are, are valid alternatives for local public libraries. And Holly, you can, you can elaborate here and I can uh, jump in as well on the right-hand side. Okay, so when we've already talked about this uh, idea that you would have bandwidth increments and um, in your contract terms for the bid, and this would be part of the RFP that we're going to be discussing shortly. Um, it, that way, you have a basically a scalable situation, and because we're hoping that if you build it and you bring fiber, they will come, and you may not know what you can do. And you know, I could see programming uh, working with other uh, organizations in your county or anywhere else. You, it gets out that you have some some fast internet, and you may be a gathering spot for a lot of um, opportunities for programming. But by doing that, you allow yourself just to to check um, and move up uh, to a faster speed. Um, the for the research and draft the key narrative for the 470 RFP document, um, and it's separately posted. I have put together, and we'll discuss it shortly. Well, I shouldn't say I, because I use a lot of internet help, and Tom was a great uh, contributor for to tell me yes or no as far as what things I put together. But we used a kind of a standardized RFP for our libraries this last year, and we were quite lucky, I think, that. We didn't hear a lot back from USAC telling us that, you know, where's this or where's that. It was more that they they hadn't really read it to know where things were. So we would be providing that to you. So you you really don't have to come up with anything more original than, um, and that's not original, is but find and replace for much of it and provide contact information. Uh, we we have text that is appropriate, we believe, for all the libraries and also uh, a calendar of events. That would be something personal that you would have to put together as far as the activities to go from uh, applying, sending out a 470 to um, actually um, having the construction work done. And we'll go over that shortly. So that would be something you have to do. But hopefully when you see these RFP, the RFP that we have, you'll realize it really isn't that difficult. And I. Um, and I'm sure Krista could help you too, would be happy to assist you with uh, anything you might not understand about it. Um, and so again, it's just, you also have to, and that's why the calendar is critical in the very beginning. You need to know what your dates are and when you need to be ready. I know you li library directors and libraries are busy all the time and you do have to fit that into your schedule. Um, and I think both uh, for, on our behalf, Krista and myself, we try to be very flexible and help you out. But we have to remember, like with Krista, she's also not just working with special construction. She's working, you know, primarily with um, uh, uh, recurring costs for internet service at the same time. All those deadlines, even though they're different types of 470 filings, you need to be thinking about being prepared. And lucky you have me because I will help you with that. If you're a part of this, I, I will give you gentle reminders, seriously, you know, <laughs> and to help you with that. Um, and Tom, I guess I kind of took it all the way down. So you're on the yep. other side. What would you like to say? Well, and this may be obvious to anyone on the call, but by contracting with a provider locally at the library level, you are in direct contact with that provider all the time. Mm -hmm. And some library directors like that because they know who to call. If there's a problem with the service, they're dialing that 1-800 number and getting a response and seeing it through until it's resolved for whatever reason. And uh, that goes with any of the service disruptions that, but a potential disadvantage is sometimes you feel very alone and sometimes powerless when you've been on the phone for a couple hours and it can get very frustrating. 
in the network Nebraska model, we watch all the fiber circuits that are connected to our backbone. We have a 24 seven help desk operators at the university that watch these circuits um, all hours of the day and night. So if there was a potential outage because of electrical or fiber break or whatever, by the time the library opens the next morning, there's a high likelihood that a trouble ticket has already been submitted on behalf of the library and that trucks have been rolling in order to solve the problem so that you have the minimum amount of downtime. So that's um, some people just prefer that and they don't there you're paying a fee. That's a service that results. Um, one of the interesting loopholes in separating um, transport from internet is that SIPA compliance is only required if there is an internet service being supported by E-rate. In our model, you can get E-rate on the actual fiber transport circuit by itself, but the internet that flows over the fiber circuit, we separate out as a separate service. And if a library was diametrically opposed to filtering, for some reason, you could still get E-rate on the transport, but pay a slightly higher rate for internet from Network Nebraska, like a college or university would, because they're not eligible for E-rate. Some libraries find that attractive. Uh, Lincoln Public Library is one of those, uh, but Grand Island and Omaha Public are, Library are full participants in E-rate. Um, we receive their invoices monthly, we pay their bills, file for E-rate, and then just charge them the net part of their bill as if you were receiving discounts from your vendor. So anyway, that's kind of a comparison. If you have additional questions, you can um, reach out to me individually and I'd be happy to explain. I, I have to, an, an anecdotal story about all this is I, when Tom talks about how nice it is, well, he doesn't say how nice it is, but I can say, I'm sure that there are library directors who have showed up in the morning and have a full plate on their hands and potentially their usual users are coming in to use the internet and it's down. And they're kind of powerless. They call the company up and they say, well, you know, we are not, we don't know yet. And, you know, you may not be their most important customer. Um, 10 years ago, I was working to install some network equipment at a library and um, I was getting almost ready and completed with it. And then I went off for lunch and I came back and everything, nothing worked. And of course, I, I didn't think that it was the, the provider, you know, so I spent another hour troubleshooting. And then finally, um, I did call the provider because it came to my senses and they're like, oh, well, we're, we're not, we're down right now. We don't know, you know, when we can fix this. And so um, I think I would rather just be able to enjoy a cup of coffee and get a phone call that says, you know, we know we're down and we're working on this and, and we're going to fix it. So I could see the other side also of this. But again, it's a, it's a, a matter of, you know, your, your rubric and your decision once you get your bids as to uh, what what you might find is best for your community. So I just want to say that I, I feel the pain of, and I've heard many stories from library directors, and if hopefully you're not one of them, but um, that have been down for a day or two and really no resource to call because nobody is, you know, available to talk to them. They're too busy. Whereas Network Nebraska would be uh, proactively working on something like that. So thank you, Tom. Okay, what's next? Oh, we have. Next. Yep, and we can partner on this one as well, Holly. Mm -hmm. So um, so again, the two processes are very similar, hearkening back to the calendar that you saw earlier in the presentation. But now's the time to learn about the program, what the requirements are, what the timeline will be, and how you need to put that into your own um, work schedule with the public library, or in the case of the regional directors, you may be re-explaining this process to other libraries that were not able to attend. But each of the two procurements um, can include their own bandwidth increments. Um, 
the resulting contracts that are signed with the provider have different um, durations in the state. We tend to use a 48 month uh, contract and then allow the library to re-examine their bandwidth needs on an annual basis. And you can increase those um, each year or keep them the same. Um, Holly's been working with libraries the past year, as well as Krista on the RFPs. And you might want to explain uh, those durations of agreement or contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and the RFP that uh, we present to you, um, we're, we have a uh, three-year contract um, set up and the increments. So you have three-year contract and then you have incrementally from 100 to whatever there's probably five or six spaces available for the uh, vendor to respond to and give you some pricing. Just to let you know, I, um, I did have one library that um, uh, they went with a half a gig or 500 megabits, you know, because the pricing was so great. And she was like, you know, I'm not going to start it with 100 or 200. You know, I'm, I'm going to go for the whole enchilada right off the bat. And, um, and again, it was very reasonable pricing. And, and oftentimes you'll find these vendors, some of them, and this is a local um, uh, telephone company wanting to support its community, um, have, have some excellent pricing. But that also can can be your decision um, as to what you do. But what you'll find is, like Tom said, that probably the longer the contract, the the better the pricing opportunity too. And we should add that somewhere between the August and October timeframes, the two different RFPs uh, will be in process. Again, we have to wait at least 28 days with uh, bids to be submitted. Then we evaluate, we award. And in the state's situation, we actually contract with the vendor and put those bandwidths into contract with costs associated, but there's no obligation to buy. It's sitting there as kind of like a buffet line that you either decide to go through or you don't. And you may, may elect to use your local agreement with a provider, internet service provider to go forward. Um, it's worthy of mention here that the reason that this whole program got started and approved for Nebraska is the governor's rural broadband task force. And we were seeing early on that libraries and schools have a significant role to play in communities in providing high level connectivity. We would like for the public libraries in every Nebraska community to be the most advanced, fastest speeds available to general patrons. And we think that there's good results to come with that. You know, the ability to apply for jobs, to get um, telehealth services, to get webinars, to participate in virtual field trips, video conferencing, or just coming in to do normal internet dependent activities that if they return to their farm or ranch, for example, their bandwidth may be quite deficient. So we really want this to be a total magnet for the community with the library at the center. That's extremely powerful. And Holly mentioned a story about one of our libraries participating in the Sparks grant from 2018 and parents were invited into an open house to see the homework hotspot that had been established for their children in the public library with the speeds that were coming from the school district. And the, the parents said, oh yeah, sure, I don't mind looking. And once they saw the refresh rate of internet that was 1500 times faster than what they were used to, they couldn't believe it, but they had never experienced it. So when Holly said they don't know what they're missing, uh, this is one of those examples. So anyway, thanks for allowing me to share that story. And I guess I I would just like to um, offer uh, one one more bit of information. I think sometimes if you're in a small rural community, you may even know the tech person for um, what, the vendor that services that committee uh, that community for the most part, but. 
I was surprised at um, the bidding process and in a few cases, uh, the the more incumbent provider didn't win the contract and uh, another provider came in and offered a, a far better deal. And one of the other things is to be thinking about when you hear from your tech person, you know, what, what it's going to cost to bring that fiber in that may or may not be coming from the business manager of that particular company. And that business manager may have some other reasons for wanting to give you a sweeter deal. And so um, I, I do really, you know, want to push for you to think about making sure that you, if you're interested at all to just go fishing, you know, submit a 470 with, a, you know, with an RFP, with uh, Network Nebraska and uh, with you locally working with Krista and, and myself and find out, you know, what's out there. Uh, you may be surprised. I mean, I was genuinely surprised in a couple of cases. Mm -hmm. And that's it for me from that slide. Okay, um, we do have the next slide here is break. Um, we can do a five minute or do we not have time or? We can do a break, yeah. Um, do you just wanna see, um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in. I have one question that came in from Chuck that I wanna um, just answer quickly before we do go to break, because um, it is an important question. Um, about E-rate, going back to when I was talking about E-rate. Um, he says that um, I just found out all phones in Hebron have fiber. How does that affect E-rate? We have internet through the phone company, he's basically saying. Um, that's actually good to mention phones. Uh, what your provider would need to do is your the bills somehow have to be separated out, phone charges and internet charges. You receive an E-rate discount on just the internet, not on the telephone connections. Um, it's fine if the phones have fiber, or you go through fiber, that's, that's great, but they will need to provide some sort of way of determining this is the actual part of the fiber that's providing the internet, as opposed to this is the part that's doing the phone, and E-rate only gives you a discount on the internet portion of that. Most providers know about that and will be able to do that, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let's take a break. It's um, 55 now, 155 now. Mm -hmm. um, it was five, would five minutes be okay? We can come back up right at the top of the hour. I think that sounds great. Chance to run to your restroom, do what you need. <laughs> Get a drink. Um, answer answer a few questions from somebody. <laughs> whatever you do. Yeah. Um, so we'll take a break. We'll come back right at um, two o'clock at the top of the hour to continue on. Um, if you do think of any questions while you're sitting there, go ahead and type them in and we'll grab them when we come back. Uh, it is 2.01 if we want to start up again. Um, do we need Tom back right now or can you just go ahead with no, this part? I, can go. I think it's fine. I can go ahead and move forward. <laughs> There, there he is. is. There is. <laughs> oh, we need Tom back. We need Tom back. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we've been talking about this request for proposal and uh, throughout uh, this presentation so far. And and for uh, special construction, um, it's required uh, for your E-rate 470 form. And you can see the reason why, um, if, as we're talking about things, the complex complexity of all the things that need to be done. And I just pulled these kind of blurbs off the internet, but I think it, it basically describes it. RFP should be used when a project is sufficiently complex, requires a great deal of technical information. And I believe most libraries that I've talked to about this project, their, their biggest concern is that they will be visiting um, with USAC or about to, something technical for um, for their fiber to their library and of course that's part of in the RFP the vendor that you choose decide says yes we will be your technical con contact as USAC is uh, making a decision whether they want to fund the project or not so these this kind of information is laid out in the RFP for both uh, your protection as a library and so that the vendor understands uh, what um, what you're after. Again, we talked about this, this last year was the first year for the special construction projects for Nebraska. This was the first time the funding had been used. Um, it was available, I think, I don't know how many years, Krista, uh, four or five years more? Four or five, yeah. yeah. 
but no, nobody had stepped forward. And, and I honestly think it was fantastic that the Rural Broadband Task Force uh, looked at a way of making that happen because it really is that last 20% that, that the, the these small, small communities and maybe your community would have a hard time coming up with to pay, you know, or the last 30% and now you only have to worry about 10%. So anyway, so we put this RFP together and um, and it was utilized last year. And what we're going to do, uh, when we put it together last year, it was after we'd had even had our training. I It wasn't complete yet. Um, so you'll have the benefit of uh, seeing this uh, uh, ahead of time to kind of get an idea of really how much you, how little and you do have to do, I should say, because it isn't uh, the, that complicated. It's a lot, the template is there. So I'll let Krista bring that up and then we'll go through some of the pages of it that are, I feel are important. I'm gonna switch to, there you go. Now you should see. Okay. There we go. All right, so this is just to, to give you kind of an idea as to what the, oh, I can't see it now myself. I did send something. Um, the table of content, what is included um, in the RFP. You see, if, if you look at the bottom there, it's 28 pages. Um, and it, that might seem lengthy to you, but in many cases, it, the template is, is pretty much done. Um, just some filling out needs to be taken care of by you. So uh, one of the things, um, if we look here, Tom talked a little bit about uh, special construction um, and the vendors and the background of this. And he put together a, a very nice piece that's in there that kind of explains to the vendors who will be receiving this, talking about where this happened and when, did, when we actually, I mean, why this happened. And so it's a good thing for them to have. They won't be asking you lots of questions. Okay, one of the things you put in there is a picture. So this happens to be the Clay Center Public Library. And so you have an option of a graphic or a picture you put in and you can see the address goes in there. Um, the other part of this is uh, you have a sequence of activities. And I talked about this as probably being one of the more extensive things. You're counting on your fingers and counting in your ca calendar and trying to figure out where that 28 days is and, and uh, uh, how many days you need to do this or that and, and where that uh, 471 uh, form needs to be submitted by. Um, so it, this is a lot of just time spent to kind of lay out your plan for your calendar. If you look here on the on under the activity, um, the release of solicitation would be the day that uh, you work either with Krista or on your own and actually submit your form 470 saying, hey, I'm here. I'm looking for fiber to my library. And then we allow a few days for questions to come back and forth between the library. And, and in that case, if you have a question that you can't answer, you can come to me and um, I I'm, will be able to help you to answer that. We used uh, uh, the Library Commission's um, website as the platform for that type of activity to go on. I think there was only one library that had a question uh, that needed to be answered out of all seven of them. Um, and so the library responds to the question. So it's actually you as the director, but more than likely it, it will be formatted by myself. And if I don't know the answer, I'll find out the answer and put a, put a response back together for you. Um, so the bidders then have a deadline. Um, and there's things written inside of the RFP that say you cannot send me an email with this. You have to either have it mailed and delivered by midnight at this time, or you can hand deliver it if you want. And then we chose a team of three uh, to do the review. And all of this, you can take to whomever it is in your community. If they want to modify something, I, I really do suggest you take it to your go-to person in your community to look through it and make sure they may even take it to a, a legal kind of uh, uh, path pass through uh, to see. I'm not saying suggest that they do that, but know that that's probably something that you should at least make available to them. Uh, and so they'll uh, review, uh, the open the bids and review the bids, and then they'll think about it. 
perhaps and and make a decision come together and make a decision and we'll look farther in the RFP to see how they how that's managed and then you'll notify an intent to award because uh, you uh, you're you're not necessarily uh, saying that they are going to be awarded the contract uh, but there's a time period that you can go back and forth you say we would like you to be the vendor the, of choice but you may have questions or maybe your community ends up with a few questions for them until you can finally award um, a contract and when that contract is awarded that's basically submitting your 471 to um, form and so there is a deadline uh, that could be uh, for that also um, when you submit it to USAC and then uh, after that you have the award recipient and you wait for the funding commitment decision letter that FCDL is critical it's written in the RFP that nothing will happen so that protects you and the library and the community as far as building fiber until uh, you have received that and you also have it written in the contract that you will sign with the vendor so nothing at all it can all if you don't get the funding you can't afford to put fiber in so that's how you manage that let's move on let's see what i have um and so again this was this would be good for you to read too as uh, participants this kind of gives you a nice overview of of how this nusf funding uh, became available we'll just move on and and let that be something um, I, I can make that available to you if you want, and you'll certainly see it in August because we'll probably go over this in much more detail. So here, the scope of services, whoever the vendor is who's interested in this needs to know what it is you want. And in the case of the libraries we're looking, uh, who are looking to move forward with this project, it's Lit Fiber. But again, all of this is all pre-filled out you're just putting in the library name and information. And here we see, this is the first place we have this. We, we have a place for the bidders to check to say, yes, um, I, I've read this and I agree to comply. And so you'll see this highlighted red all throughout the document. Uh, let's see, what was my next thought about? Uh, you tell the library about yeah special construction because this, this means that they have to provide certain information um, in their response for you to uh, be able to, um, for them to be able to be awarded the, the contract, not awarded the contract, but for them to be able to pass USAC's uh, review of um, whether they are able to uh, move forward with the contract and that USAC will pay. Okay, so there's a Lit Fiber Services. Um, let's see. How about if we go to the rubric? Is that next? This is more detailed part about the activities, kinds of kind of explains it all. So the rubric is where you have your three folks that you meet up with. You have uh, the copies of all of the different responses to the RFP. They've all read them. This scoring rubric was just an example, but seemed that many libraries didn't change uh, much of it. Again, price is your primary um, uh, more, most weighted. Um, uh, criteria for awarding the contract. There is something in here I thought was interesting, and it was for you know 20 points, which could be significant in some cases. But the the bidder completed a walkthrough of the library, and it wasn't required in the RFP, um, and not all of them did that. But um, I know the library directors really appreciated having a, a walkthrough from the library. And in one case, it was a walkthrough as far as points awarded. They were very competitive, but um, that took them over the top. Um, so then they come up with, they decide on their points. They all come together and they show, they fill the rubric out themselves. And then um, together they decide who they intend to award this too so this is a very simple um, scoring rubric that could be that is there to be used are there any questions yet for anything no if anybody does have any questions yeah type into the question section or um, anything here raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask your question um, either way if you want to know more about any of the parts of this we're still got more to go through on here but just 
I'm just highlighting pretty quickly. But now if we go to the next uh, item, the, the appendices. So this would be uh, for the, as we talked about before, I think it was um, Amber asked the question, you know, related to the, the contract related for the bandwidth versus, you know, when if the fiber is in or not. So in this case, this, this contract for fiber, the company is also bidding for services. So we have uh, non-recurring costs and then we have re uh, recurring costs. So this is a recurring cost, and this is where we talked about the bandwidth would be itemized out under the column of bandwidth, and you could have a one, two, or three-year contract. I told all the libraries, and it, t it turned out that way, but recommended that even though you had that information, and I wouldn't go farther than three years out, that uh, the, all libraries awarded the, the three-year uh, location. I mean, three-year contract. So this would be one part that is critical for also making your decision together with your rubric, because you're going to take this analysis from your RFP along with, if we move next to the next, with the appendix B for uh, the special construction, this is where you're going to find out the cost of the fiber coming to your library. And it's interesting um, that th what I said at the end right before break is so true. You don't realize sometimes where fiber is in your community. And um, so in, in some cases, fiber was in the parking lot for one library, was 400 feet away for another one. Now, uh, another one, it was seven miles away, but actually they won the bid even for the incumbent that was in town because uh, they just, their, their pricing was just <laughs> so much better. And their, and especially their um, their monthly recurring costs for the three-year contract for internet, you know, after the fiber was there. So this would be also a critical piece that when the RFP comes back to you, it's going to be filled out with information for to help you make an analysis of the data for the cost. And then there's one more, I'm not sure I said to stop there, but let's go, it's the C, the next one down, it's a little ways down. And this one here is option, kind of, it's, it's optional, I believe, when you fill the 470 out, but when you fill the 471 out, um, the USAC wants to have a lot more details about what, uh, mm -hmm. what you're doing. And Krista um, saved our, our, our fledgling group of seven libraries and help them out because in some cases our RFP responders did include information. What did you say it was the number of feet? Yeah, they, there's a question that says, that specifically says how many feet of, you know, how many, what is the distance, how many feet? And since that wasn't in the realize other. that was required, um, mm -hmm. that we had to, um, and it, um, we're going to change that now for this next round. It's yeah, you won't have that problem. Sure we get all that. <laughs> um, but it was actually very interesting to see how they could so easily work with the provider. Because um, at least twice that I recall, I was in a go to webinar session with someone. We were going through their 471. We got to that point, and I had a copy of the response and the and the um, contract, and I couldn't find it anywhere. And the library director just says, oh, let me call them. Okay. So we just, you know, I stayed on the line. We stayed connected. They had a quick phone call. They got the person on the phone within a minute and said, I just need to know how many, you know, sometimes it was how many strands they'd forgotten or how many feet. And they said, oh, yeah, it's this much. Okay. Come back, put it in. So not even five minutes, we had an answer. So um, they know the information. That we just didn't realize it, you know, having it ahead of time. Would have been just, yeah, five minutes less time to have to do it. And then um, at the last page, basically, it is uh, the signature, and this signature would be whomever is authorized to sign with the, whatever the company is um, that is uh, responding to your bid. But it was very interesting because some, oh, there's some pretty fancy RFPs that came back to the libraries, you know, spiraled and beautiful photos mm -hmm. and, and, and all kinds of diagrams of everything and anything. Yeah. That we don't even know. 
But but one thing I will do. One another thing we will do is ask for a, uh, when we ask for. I think we ask for three copies to come back to the library if, if they were uh, interested in bidding. We are going to make sure that they give an electronic form of it because that was a, the biggest challenge for the library directors was to make copies of these things that were all spiraled yes. together. So <laughs> that was kind of funny because the the contract or some of this is going to need to be submitted to E-rate and it needs to be done electronically. Right. Having a pretty binder is nice, but it doesn't help when it comes to having it to right. Yeah. <clears throat> to undo it and scan it. So when and so that's basically if you have a question about uh, the RFP for special construction, um, now would be the time to ask and you know you can contact me afterwards if you want to, but if it's a question that might help others if I've not explained something um, well, but but again, it is simply, it is pretty much a fill in the blank type of a thing. Um, there isn't a lot of original thought or you can put it in. Again, the other piece of this is you really should be sure to not just fill this out without letting somebody in your local government, you know, uh, know what you're doing because they'll make them nervous and maybe they'll they'll be okay with you saying oh I was just going fishing but it they may be concerned about you submitting something like this and and not know anything about it if we have time I would like to put up uh, and just kind of over talk at the the RFP for the or two so we've talked a little bit kind of alluded to this um, that it's possible you might need to upgrade your equipment, but again, I was one for this yeah, is one you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, this is fine. Um, so uh, this in, in category two, um, you're not required to uh, provide an RFP, but I think that it's a, a really great way, especially if you have a number of pieces of equipment that you might need to get if you'll. I can't see the bottom part of it if you scroll right about there. You can see it's you know very easy to put the number of quantity, your model, your part number, a description, or in, and in the text up above, it talks a little bit about the, the library and it says, you know, something this or uh, equipment um, that uh, is similar. And right above here, what I see on my screen, it says no refurbished, remanufactured equipment will be accepted. I don't believe E-rate allows you to do that. Uh, for funding so that's why that's probably in there so this would be uh, if you had uh, myself come or if we did it uh, remotely do an assessment of what your equipment is and I would encourage you even if you choose not to move forward with this fiber I'd be happy to work with you to do a network uh, equipment uh, review with your library so that uh, even wherever you're at, you may be able to get a faster uh, speed um, inside the building if you have the appropriate equipment. Uh, I think that is, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say. And again, this will be addressed more in our, our next training in August, uh, but I thought I'd just give you an idea of what that would look like also. Does anybody have any questions about the RFPs? Either one of them, anything else you want to see, anything you had more detailed questions about right now before we continue on? Yeah. All right, we'll switch back to our slides. So how are you going to introduce this part? Well, I, I can. I'm just going to say money, 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 money. It's out there. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, but but really, truthfully, um, pay attention to what uh, Krista and Tom are talking about. I know you all are, I'm sure, but um, there is funding and money available. Um, and if you place it in the right way or work with it, you know, you may find that you don't need to apply to category two to get some network equipment that you might need in your library. Um, if you're looking toward fiber, I, you know, the dates, there's there's some complexity to it as far as, you know, when that money will be available, will it still be available um, in next year? Or can I install it now and, and all of that type of thing? But, but really, 
it is, there are lots of opportunities for funding for things even beyond uh, fiber, which is we're talking about today and uh, just pay attention. So thank you. So I thought I'd take a chance here and um, update um, everyone, all the attendees on two bills um, that just passed through the legislature out of almost a dozen that were introduced. Uh, the first one's LB338, changes provisions regarding broadband and funding, and is really a corrective action to a bill from last year. Um, but what I want you to focus on here is this is no time for libraries to be staying in one place with their broadband because the definitions around us are changing. So right now the FCC mm -hmm. indicates that the definition of broadband is 25 megabits download and three megabits upload or greater. And that's really a residential standard or guideline. As community anchor institutions, we'd like our schools and libraries to be as fast as they can be or as fast as they can afford and to be a real uh, anchor and show place for advanced telecommunications. Well, here the definition for Nebraska is changing. This bill indicates that advanced telecom is now 100 down and 20 meg up. And so if you're not being served by those speeds in your community, you could think of yourself if at least being underserved, if not unserved. And we'll see that on the next slide. So this bill, uh, mainly enables the Public Service Commission to take greater control of the funding provided by the Nebraska Universal Service Fund. When we talk about E-rate, that is a federal universal service fund. Mm -hmm. Nebraska has its own fund, and that's what um, has helped fund the NUSF 117 project that we're speaking of today. So um, it allows the PSC in the funding that they provide to telecom providers uh, to take greater control over how that gets used and greater accountability on the part of providers. This bill was signed by the governor on May 5. It's immediately in effect. Next slide. Okay. There we go. LB388, not to be confused. They both have threes and eights in them. Uh, this is the Broadband Bridge Act introduced by Senator Friesen at the request of the governor, and it was signed yesterday. So talk about timely. Um, <laughs> it provides uh, $40 million of state funding over the next two years at a 50% match level to providers and municipalities or tribal governments uh, that want to uh, compete for these grants. And so think about that as 80 million new dollars for broadband development, uh, particularly in rural areas or areas where uh, bandwidth right now is under 120. So um, midway okay. through the slide there, again, if you were a community activist and you brought this information to your city council or village board, they could actually get actively involved, find a provider that may be an incumbent or somebody who wants to come in to the community and serve and apply for these grants, probably starting up in October. Uh, the build out speed minimally must be scalable to 100 over 100 for any of the uh, customers of the service. And uh, projects must be completed within 18 months of the grant award. So even though this will be administered by the Public Service Commission, it's very reminiscent of the governor's grants that uh, were the second half of the year 2020. And the Nebraska Department of Economic Development um, awarded $30 million for 29 different projects. And it may have affected some of the communities on today's call. But the whole goal for Nebraska is to push the most advanced 
telecommunications as far as possible into rural areas, um, as well as farms and ranches. So these grants will be awarded in a priority basis. First of all, unserved. So that would be any locales proven to be under 25.3 for speeds. And then second priority would be unserved areas that are already receiving federal funding through RDOF or um, ReConnect or one of the other federal programs. But these funds may accelerate those programs and deployment faster than what the federal schedule would be. And then thirdly, you could be in an underserved area. So you're under 120 in speeds, but you have a digital inclusion plan. So this might be areas that have faster DSL or cable modems above 25.3, but still uh, not fast enough for the needs of the local library or the residents that would be in that service area. So as an information uh, service within your communities, we encourage you to find out all you can about <clears throat> these uh, pieces of legislation. We're only uh, highlighting them today, but you can be a community leader, an activist, just by having that information to share with other um, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for allowing me to share. I'll need to um, bug out here in about 15 minutes, <laughs> but uh, That's okay. if I don't get to speak again, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity uh, to participate and share info. Look forward to working with uh, any libraries on future projects. I just wanted to mention one thing um, related to this. Um, the, la the last survey data that came into the Library Commission, 50% of Nebraska public libraries are at 25 uh, megabits or less. And I would say out of that 50% that's less, mm -hmm. the, the larger number is those that are 12, <laughs> 12 and below as far as speed. We do have a couple of libraries that are just uh, 1.5 megabits. The, the remaining, 50% uh, is above 25. So as Tom has said, you know, in order to, you know, remain um, viable even some, somewhat, because if, you're, if your residentials are getting that higher speed, even though there are so many other things the library can offer, you know, that technology and what you can do there and how you could enhance your community by making sure that, you know, you're in fiber, fully scalable, and f and ready to uh, be a part of the you know the technology that makes uh, a difference in your community that'd be great. So I'm not sure you know if you if you're one of those that's under 25, which I think a few of you are. But I, I have been telling libraries to start with their contracts with the RFP, not telling them, recommending to them strongly, and that some didn't follow me, and that was okay. But I've been saying. Start at 200 if you can, at least, because it'll it'll creep up on you really fast. So if you look at a library that has 200 and you're down under 25, um, what a boost this project would be to your community and to the library. So uh, we'll talk more. But. Yeah. And now with these legislative actions um, being signed and official, it's going to be available the faster speeds i mean these are what they're saying has to be the minimums now mm -hmm. um go for the go big <laughs> um yeah, yeah. i agree it, now it, it's coming yeah right. anything else about the anybody have any questions about the legislature anything else you uh, tom or holly you have to say about this <clears throat> no thank you yeah. All right. All right. So um, we've been talking about uh, the fiber special construction that you can uh, um, get to bring fiber. And now you've got these um, legislative actions that are forcing, it's not probably not the word they like, but we'll, we'll make the providers provide even more. Um, there's lots more money, as, as I said, money, money, money uh, coming <laughs> available. Um, ARPA, I'm sure everyone's heard about ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act, um, has lots of things that are in there. It's huge. One of the things is the Institute of Museum and Library Services was awarded uh, 
$200 million and has provided, is providing part of it goes to their grants to states programs. In each state, the state library agency here in Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission gets funding from them. Um, this is similar to the funding we got last year for the CARES Act grants. If you recall, we had CARES grants. Um, that this year, it's a lot more money. We, um, the commission has been, there's a, two, there's a $2 million base for every state and then a per capita, depending on population. So we have $2.4 million here in at the Library Commission to um, spend uh, from the IMLS on library-related things. Um, let, to, to give you a perspective, last year we gave out grants to the CARES Act grant. We were given about, about 175,000 last year. So this is a huge increase for us. Um, and we have various things we're going to be um, using it for, some statewide initiatives and some things that specifically go to libraries. I'll get to in just a second. But these are the goals, the priorities from the IMLS of how this funding is to be used. Um, ultimately, everything is supposed to be in response to the pandemic. So in response to the pandemic, um, enabling libraries to reach residents with internet hotspots, Wi-Fi, other digital inclusion. So um, if you missed out on last year doing the CARES Act grants, looking for um, doing hotspot lending programs or um, updating your Wi-Fi, this is something you can now um, use this funding that's coming out now. Um, also, the second option there, rapid emergency relief to libraries to safely respond to the pandemic. That's all those PPP um, uh, equipment, um, masks, screen, um, plexiglass screens, uh, stand-up, um, hand sanitizer stations, um, all of those things related to that. If you still need to purchase any of those, um, this is in here as well. And there's a third section here that's new, was not last year. Last year for the CARES Act, it was very much in response to pandemic, do things um, virtually, do thing, you know, safety, uh, all of that. Now, as things are moving along, uh, they realize that libraries do just need their basic services still su um, supported. Um, Funding is maybe going down. Receipts are down in some communities because of the pandemics. So you're not getting as you may not be getting as much funding from your municipality. So the last one here is basically covers anything and everything a library may do, as you can see, to meet the needs of the communities with personnel, technology, training, materials, supplies, equipment, costs. So um, buying books, buying DVDs, getting um, doing training, anything and everything your library might need can fall into that third category. So these are the three priorities. Um, that the IMLS has said this funding would be used for. Specifically here at the Library Commission, we have been meeting to discuss how to give this, use this money. Um, first thing we're doing is the majority of the money, 1.4 million of it, is going to be done as direct payments to public and tribal libraries. Um, this is similar to your state aid funding that you get. So if you receive um, you know, just because you submit your public library survey, you get a chunk of money just given to you. We're going to do the same thing with some of this money. Uh, with the math, based on how many libraries we have and how much money we're allotting to this, the proposed right now base amount is $3,750. So every library will get that. And then on top of that, a per capita amount. So based on your legal service area, uh, 0.275 cents. Um, this is uh, the direct payments. They're not going to be sent just out to you exactly as the state um, aid money is, where that's just sent to you and automatically. You will need to request it um, because this is part of this specific ARPA. Uh, we do have other paperwork that needs to be done. Um, so you will say, yes, I would like that funding. We will then um, issue it out to you. And then you will have to follow up later with invoices uh, that cover um, meet these priorities of how you spend it. Um, but basically, like I said, anything could possibly fall into that. Whoops. Um, we are working on a website right now and um, applications. Uh, we had to have this approved by our NLC commissioners, which was done two weeks ago, and we are now working on getting all this done. So look for specifics coming soon for that. Um, for those uh, direct payments, unlike the CARES Act, you won't have to submit an application that states, here's the project we're going to do, here's what we're going to um, uh, uh, spend it all on. Um, we're being a little, making it a little easier for that direct payments where you just say, yes, I would like the money, and then later just start sending us invoices. Um, we had some, a few many libraries from the CARES Act grants who, because they couldn't find things or, or things changed over time, weren't exactly able to do what they originally said in their grant application, and there had to be some back and forth with that. We want to have to make it a lot easier for everybody for these direct payments. So as long as you are meeting those criteria, 
and sending us invoices. If you need to like switch gears in the middle, um, last year we had a lot of problems and we still may this year, um, hotspots. It's been hard to find them to buy them. There is huge demand. And some libraries had to switch gears and said, I just can't buy any, can I do something else? Um, with this, you won't have to even worry with us, just spend it on what you need to, send us your invoices. Um, in addition to that, we are going to offer a couple of competitive grants. Uh, we are going to have, so it's our typical, like our library improvement grants or our CARES Act last year, um, competitive grants, one specifically for maker spaces, library automation, upgrades, or changes, and other technology-related things. So if you are wanting to change to a different um, ILS system, or you need to do upgrades and update your current one, you can apply for a grant in that category. In addition to that, our Youth Grants for Excellence, our usual grants that Sally Snyder does in the fall, uh, we are giving more money towards those grants. Typically, in the last few years, she's had around $18,000, $20,000 each year to give out. We are allotting $75,000 to our Youth Grants for Excellence. So keep an eye out for those coming in the fall, usually August, September, she starts that up. Um, so with those things there that we have money coming from, you're gonna to have to think about where do I, what do I wanna to use to pay for what? <laughs> so if you have some sort of technology project, you definitely wanna look for that competitive grant to apply for. Anything youth or team related, wait for Sally's grants to come out in, in later in the year. Um, then anything else you could use your direct payment for. So you're gonna to have to think about in your head, you know, what is everything related to? What would be the best place to do this? Um, and you can do all of these. You do not have to pick and choose. You get your direct payment and you can then apply for a makerspace library automation technology grant and you can apply for youth grant for excellence. You don't have to you can pick or choose. You can do all of it. Um, in addition to that, we are doing some statewide things just so you know as well. These are not things that you would apply for, just so you know that other money is going out for things that are statewide for everybody. Um, adding money to overdrive to increase the collections, our lender compensation program for libraries who do interlibrary loan to each other. Um, each of our four regional library systems are getting a chunk of money to help them expand their services. Um, our state institutional libraries, corrections, and, and our rehab centers, they are in desperate need of upgrading their um, technology and equipment and collections, so we are allotting certain funding right to them. Um, we're also going to continue for another another year of Niche Academy, which has got online training that we've been using in the last year, and Reader Zone. If you use that for your summer reading program last year or for anything over the year for reading competitions, that was the first year of that was funded with CARES Act grants. We're going to do another year of that with um, our ARPA grant, uh, funding. Um, and then um, our book club kits and our library professional collection here at the Library Commission, we're going to add titles to those as well. So some ideas of what you can do with this, if you're wondering, you know, so what do I do with all this different money? Um, and this is not exhaustive, this is not only the things you can do, this is just to get you thinking about things. Um, look at what we did last year for CARES, that's all still available, but if you need to upgrade, update date anything, do your um, equipment improvements and upgrades. Um, now, just like E-Rate, this is federal funding, so if you are gonna do anything internet related, like um, anything that connects you to the internet, uh, you will need to be SIPA compliant, so that is something to think about. Um, but it's just another place to get funding for that. Uh, and lending anything, doing a hotspot lending program, um, lending laptops, tablets. Um, maybe you started that up last year or and you realize you need more or you missed the CARES Act grant last year because it was a lot less money, come to us again um, to do it this time. Um, and then just get creative with what you can do to get out into your community. Um, these are ideas what other libraries have done, uh, pop-up libraries, book bikes, uh, story walks, um, anything out there can possibly be an idea. Um, and as far as collections, last year the CARES Act was specifically about doing things digital and virtual, but we specifically asked, and this money can also be used for physical collections, so you can buy books, magazines, DVDs, anything that you need to lend, you lend at your library, and of course the digital content. Um, and then all the your COVID-19 safety things. Um, now that we are getting into potentially opening up and having people come more into the library, people are talking a lot more about air filters and purifiers. How do we keep the air circulating to keep it safe, safer indoors when people are inside? Um, that might be something. Uh, Someone already asked about self-checkout stations. You could, you could um, different self-checkout stations um, to help you know keep distance. And those touchless hand sanitizer and soap dispensers, I never 
investigated myself, but I learned from the CARES Act grants, those are pricey. <laughs> so if you wanted to get those, you didn't have them before, or you want more, um, that is definitely something. So this is just some ideas of what you could use this for. Now, there's even other money coming too, <laughs> because there has to be more. Um, the Emergency Connectivity Fund. This is something, also a new program, part of ARPA. And this is specific, this is uh, a lot of people talk about this as um, more E-rate, some funding added to E-rate. Um, it's not exactly, I, I describe it as E-rate adjacent because it is using the same E-rate system, but it is not for um, adding more money to your, what you get in discount on that is E-rate considered E-rate. This is specifically for remote learning um, to close that homework gap or the connectivity gap. Um, this is something we have known for years in the library world and school world that um, kids are in school and this is something that our Sparks grant addressed, was working to address. And then they go home and they do not have the connection at home to continue and do their homework. They come to the library to try to do it or they go to the, the neighborhood bar, whoever has the, the internet. We've known this forever. The past year of the pandemic, other people who have realized that this is a thing and a problem that needs addressing. So uh, $7.1 billion has been allotted to help close this. And what this is specifically providing internet connection off campus as they describe it, outside of the library, beyond the library's uh, lo lo walls and property, beyond the school's walls and property. And that's where you get that big difference between what's E-rate and what's emergency connectivity fund. E-rate is on campus, um, in the library, Emergency Connectivity Fund, ECF, another acronym, is sending that connection out. So you already have a connection at your library for internet, and now you can purchase um, Wi-Fi hotspots, modems, routers, um, construction to make that go to somewhere else, to um, use it in someone's home or in a community center. It will be using that same EPIC system that you use to apply for E-rate, and it's being administered by USAC, um, because the FCC and their orders have said they know USEC has done this kind of thing before with E-Rate, we'll have them handle this program as well. But it's a separate program, it's its own, it's not E-Rate, just gonna use that same interface. Uh, something new about this too, that if you remember E-Rate does not cover, this will cover the devices themselves as well. Laptops and tablets can be used. This can be used to purchase laptops and tablets for um, to be uh, loaned out and given to your um, patrons. Uh, specifics about this is to help um, uh, patrons who are unable to get good enough internet at their homes. Um, we expect there to be a filing window for this opening up this summer. Um, we're still waiting for the specifics and the details on how it all works, so keep your eyes open for that. Once I do know what all that is, I will hold a specific special workshop just about the Emergency Connectivity Fund and how to apply for it. Um, and this is also for purchases to be made in the future to start with. So buying things in the next, what they will call the E-rate funding year, they're using the same year, July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. If there's enough funding left after that is people have applied, libraries and schools have applied for that, they will do a retrospective, they can do a retrospective window. It's been allowed um, going back to the beginning of the pandemic in March of last year. So anything you had pre already purchased, you may be able to get a reimbursement for. That will depend. Uh, we'll see. Oh, and I should mention this now that I've mentioned going back. The ARPA funding that we have at the commission, that is also you can apply for uh, reimbursements on things that you had purchased going back to when we were awarded this funding, which was the exact date is March or April. I'll know, I'll get that to you. But um, so if you'd already bought something and we're now finally letting you apply for these grants and for the direct funding, um, direct payments, you can go back to then. Um, we did the same thing last year, the CARES Act grant. We were awarded the funding in April, March, April. We worked on getting it all worked out and how it was gonna be awarded, how you can apply for it um, by the summer. And then, um, but you were able to give us invoices going back. Um, so the key emergency connectivity fund, this is can be anywhere education occurs, not just at the home. You know, we think of the homework gap as the kids go home and they have no connection, um, but anywhere that you might be doing educating. So in churches, on school buses, Wi-Fi hotspots on school buses, community centers, homeless centers, um, any of those other kiosks or places that you set up. So um, get creative and think about that. Um, the key also though about the hotspots and the laptops and tablets is they must be used outside the library. Um, 
many times you might buy hotspots um, and loan laptops and have people use well not hotspots but laptops and tablets um, you may check out them to, for someone to use in your building the, the laptops and tablets you specifically buy from this money has to be taken out of the library. That's the whole point is you're extending the library or the school's internet connection out into the community. So you will have to differentiate between which laptops are for use in-house and which ones get checked out. Um, something else to be very clear about this as well is um, even though some people do use their phones to do things, smartphones and PC desktops are not allowed in this um, program. It's specifically thinking about being um, portable, more portable, but bigger. So laptops and tablets specifically. Um, any questions? I have well, one other thing here to talk about, but I want to, any questions about these, yeah, the ARPA funds and the emergency connectivity funds. Um, both ARPA, so go ahead and type in or raise your hand and I'll get grab your question. Um, but while I'm waiting to see if you do have any, um, both of these are coming soon with how to apply for them. <laughs> And um, one last thing is the Emergency Broadband Benefit, EBB. That is a um, new program. Um, another way that um, low-income households can get um, just um, get internet, good internet to their houses. Um, this is a temporary program um, through the FCC, 3.2 billion, um, which gives a discount on broadband service um, and a discount on purchasing um, so an individual could purchase a laptop, a tablet, or a desktop computer. This program is specifically for consumers. The Emergency Connectivity Fund, ARPA, um, spe uh, Special Construction, E-Rate, that's all the libraries and schools apply for. This one is your community members. So something for you to encourage them to do, but also to realize that they may be able to start getting a discount on their, be able to afford better broadband at home. Um, they'll get a $50 discount on their service, and then um, a one-time discount of $100 to purchase a laptop, tablet, or desktop computer. Um, they will have to do a small co-payment to go along with those. But this is temporary and will end once these funds are exhausted or six months after the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services says that the COVID-19 pandemic is over. So um, that is something these people will have to plan for is that eventually this $50, month, $50 per month discount will end. Right now, consumers can apply for that, get emergencybroadband.org. Um, you'll notice if you do go there that it is on the USAC website. They are also administering this program, but it is not through the EPIC system because this is for consumers, not for libraries and schools. So it's a whole separate section there, but you will recognize that. So with all these different things you have, there's lots of different ways that internet is being hopefully increased. Um, I'm thinking if uh, homes here are saying they want this $50 a month discount, uh, they will help encourage providers to increase their um, speeds, um, as will the legislation we have here in Nebraska. Um, and then you as a library will just decide where, what funding you're gonna use for what purpose. And hopefully this isn't too confusing, but we'll give you some ideas on how you can do this. <laughs> Anything else, uh, uh, Holly, that you wanted to add about any of these? Or? No, just, you know, fiber for your library with all the funding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a lot of money coming from lots of different places, so go and investigate it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And ask us for questions if you have anything else. All right, and now. So this, we're at the tail end here, just a couple more slides and we're running out of time. We have nine minutes to get you out the door here, but um, I um, just had a couple of things I wanted to mention. The broadband toolkit, I, some libraries, I don't really think that I'm listed that we had today that any of them may have participated in this, or perhaps you have seen it as, um, I think it's part of our continuing education, it's available, but this is a, great uh, tool for you to use, especially in this conversation today. If you're feeling like you don't really understand a lot of this, this is a, the, the person on the street kind of knowledge and helps in the words and has a great uh, glossary of information that will help you to maybe take a look, sit down in your library and, and uh, well, actually you won't be sitting, you'll be moving around and uh, looking at things and finding about things related to your network configuration. 
Um, if you choose to move forward and you would like an assessment for your network equipment, I um, have been using this for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, when I go out to a library, certainly could be done via a Zoom session to help you to uh, kind of empower you to know more about the technology in your library um, and to be making decisions, especially with, like we say, all this funding available, uh, making good decisions that uh, will um, help your community and your library. We have that linked off. We have a broadband website on our commission page, and I have a link to it off our e-rate page too. So yeah, for all those products. Reasons. Right, and, and if you have any questions about, I, oh, then I think also you can receive CE credit for for um, if you complete that. And um, it had historically been that uh, it got passed back to me, and um, looked it over, and that, and then, but you keep a copy of it because that's the cool thing about this toolkit. Is you keep it in the library and um, and uh, every you can share it with your staff um, or uh, go back and consult it again if you get a call or you're calling somebody about a problem that you have. So anyway, uh, the other um, opportunities that are for resources again we talked about the special construction uh, training that's going to be happening in August. I don't have a date yet for it. Our first one was to, supposed to be, I think, six hours. It turned into kind of more, a little longer than that. I, I think we were maybe at seven hours. Um, Not all at once, no panic. No, 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 yeah, right. It was <laughs> over over two days. Again, that's CE credit too, if you're interested. But during that, we'll work with, uh, Krista will be basically uh, kind of, I, I think we can probably put people, we had the last, uh, Last year, we had folks online logging on to their EPC profile account and working their way through, not necessarily completing, but and this this year, depending on how we do it, they might be able to because they could have an RFP given to them ahead of time and checked, and they could actually submit their, you know, uh, their 470 if they wanted to. But talking a little bit more about SIPA, um, I I we will not endorse any particular product. But I'm wondering if there's different ways. I don't know a lot about it. Krista would know more. But if there's, you know, web-based systems, or if there are ones that are more local control, it might be nice to just kind of give an overview of um, how they work uh, so people can make an informed decision. Myself, personally, when I get asked a question about what to use for filtering, I often recommend that you talk to a, a community library that's close by you so that if they're using it and then you can go see what they're what they do or how it's how it's installed there and how it works or if they don't like it at all then i guess i wouldn't go visit them i'd be continuing to pursue other opportunities um let's see and also i know that i i false advertise a little bit here i expected to at least get one of our library directors who's part of this first group going through to um, give you a testimony or talk and it's they're not it's the, the reason they're not here isn't because none of them like us or anything <laughs> the reason is they were all so busy it was amazing the stuff they had going on and I'd like to think it's because they're preparing like a mother for a baby's birth or a family for a baby's birth they're getting other things done in their libraries where they're getting ready for fiber they've got other things going on so um, I think definitely for uh, the um, uh, present or for our training in August that I'd like to have it for a brief time a panel of our library directors to come in and, and give you the real story from their point of view and of course at the Commission um, we've said it over and over again Krista and I are available and Tom is an excellent resource too um, I would say if you have a question that we can't answer we may send it on to Tom I'd like to filter it for him because he's a pretty busy person we are too but I but he does have some good uh, some information that he may be able to to provide for you especially if you're interested in network Nebraska I would definitely just contact him directly through with an email and of course we have three of our regional system directors who have been participating today and we see them as a resource also um, certainly uh, they can answer questions for you or get in touch with us Hopefully they can get the word out. I hope that each one of you, if you're excited about this and you have another community library, public library, that uh, person that you're engaged with, that you share this information with them because um, I think it's critical. This is the time and uh, 
we have um, this opportunity for you to move to fiber. Again, remember, it's fully scalable. It doesn't matter if you have DSL at you know, 100 megabits right now. Um, yeah, you've got fast speed, it's adequate. But at some point, there's a threshold for what DSL can do. And as I understand it, you know, I know that the companies aren't investing in DSL anymore. Obviously, fiber is where they're going. So if you can move to fiber and you still want the same speed, great, but you're completely scalable. So I'm off my soapbox. I guess we'll wait and hear if there are any other questions. Yeah, so if you have, we have a few more minutes left and we'll stick around as long as you need to ask questions. If you have any um, desperate questions you want to ask us right now, type it in the question section, raise your hand, I'll unmute you. Um, you can ask that way. But there is also our contact information, phone numbers and emails for all three of us. Um, we did record this today. Uh, so this recording will be um, made available to you soon if you needed to revisit anything or, as Holly was just saying, share with other libraries um, who maybe were not here today. Um, you know, spread the word. Um, we'll have this and the slides available um, to you at your convenience. Uh, Denise just types in, I agree with Holly, money, 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 yes. <laughs> Lots of money available, maybe too much, maybe confusing, but hopefully we've given you some ideas. And Well, what I want to, I hope you understand is if you, um, if you feel like you're overwhelmed and, and you can't get something done, you know, related to making this kind of decision process, um, we certainly are available to talk to you about that, you know, to help you out to see your way through it. Because again, um, you know, for 10 years I've been visiting libraries and I, I'm there sometimes I'm not engaged with the library director, but I'm seeing what's going on. And so I, I really understand that you, you have to move from this to that and back again and, and uh, you know, to have a focused time to spend on uh, making decisions or, you know, uh, uh, in researching information particularly i would be happy to try to help you with that if you have a question yeah we can give you advice on what might be the best best direction and if something new comes up that we learn about <laughs> yeah okay all right it doesn't look like there's any questions right now call or emails us um if um you have any questions or if you are interested in uh doing the the special fiber construction which this was mostly about um, let us know Holly or myself send us an email and say hey I want to I'm ready to start in that we can start talking to you about it um, mm -hmm. and make sure you get involved in the training in August when we get into the step-by-step -step. well thank you very much for your time we really appreciate it I know it's precious so take care yeah thank you got a lot of thank yous coming on this is very helpful thank you so much you're welcome hopefully we'll hear from you soon <laughs>